Gunslinger 1, New Jersey. 200 live rounds. Arrested by an American tactical team, he got 10 years in prison. Gunslinger 2, Wild West Huddersfield. Firing blanks. British police shot him dead. Tonight, Panorama investigates why this man had to die, but this man lived in the line of fire. Dead of night last December, while most of Huddersfield was sleeping off the Christmas holiday, police began preparing for an armed siege. They arrived quietly, without headlights. There was a wanted man living in Maple Avenue. Three o'clock in the morning, two marksmen with carbines and semi-automatic pistols took up position at the back of the bungalow. Two more covered the front. The suspect, Robert Dixon, lived with his disabled wife, unemployed, with an imagination that worked overtime. It used to be rock and roll, and then when when he got, you know, the rock and roll was a bit too much. That's when he decided to be a cowboy. And what did he do to be a cowboy? Nothing, really. Bought himself some guns. In Yorkshire's country and western clubs, he called himself Slade. Robert Dixon liked to go in for quick draw competitions with blank firing revolvers, boasting that he was the fastest gun in the county. Last Boxing Day, he was drinking, as usual, in the bar across the street. By mid-evening, he was showing off his most prized gun to a visiting cowboy fan. Around half past midnight, he left and wandered alone through the streets, taking the long way home. He took out his gun and fired two blank shots up in the air. A neighbour moved his children to the back bedroom and called 999. I watched you tell her a Clint Eastwood film on. I heard sort of two, but like a bang and then a thud. And then I says, I says to the missus, I says, that was a gun, that. And I jumped up to the window to have a look. And he was just, that Bob Dixon was just walking on the road, nice and steady. Uh, sort of, he looked drunk, sort of slouched, you know, slouched for and sort of carrying on. And he was twiggling his hands round, a gun round in his hand, like, you know what I mean? Robert Dixon was back home in bed when armed police put his bungalow under siege. They saw a curtain move and floodlit the windows to blind him. After an hour, they saw a face at the bathroom window and called armed police, come out. I went to the toilet and the toilet's facing the greenery and the bright lights were coming from over on the green. And then I heard somebody say, so, uh, would you come out, please? And I thought, no, I'm not going out there. But I went back in and I woke Bob up and I told him what had happened. And he said, oh, don't worry. He said, I I'll see to that. So he went into the dining room and he broke his pool cube. Why did that? I don't know. Well, I heard the police radio 
and I got up to have a look to see what was happening. And I seen the police car at the back of the fence. And the police carried on calling him out. And he did come out to the door. But when he did, he was just telling the police to F off. And he looked like he had a stick in his hand and he went back in and slammed the door. He was only out there for a couple of minutes and then he came back again. And that's when he went for his gun, his Trinity. When he came back in, did he say anything? Yes, he said that he would deal with them. Deal with who? The ones that were outside. Did he say who they were? No, he didn't know. He thought they were a lot of yuppos. That's what he told me. He said, they're, they're, they're just passing about. When Robert Dixon came out of his house the second time, he was holding his gun out of sight of the police behind his leg. They say they told him to raise his right hand, and as he revealed the gun, he said, I'm going to blow you away. He knew it was loaded with blanks, but they didn't. And as he pointed his gun at the police, he fired. It was over in seconds. Just after four in the morning, Robert Dixon was hit by two of the five shots police fired at him. The armed officers had challenged him as they'd been trained, in effect, to surrender or die. When Robert Dixon failed to drop his gun and fired right at the police, he became one of the small minority of suspects who don't surrender. The death of these people is extremely regrettable. I'm, I'm really not hard-hearted in saying there's no police officer has any uh, feeling of um, warmth at all about someone being shot. But when they put themselves in that position, then they must realise the consequences of their action. But did police consider the consequences of their actions in Maple Avenue? If Robert Dixon had lived not in West Yorkshire, but in Gloucester County, New Jersey, his story might have ended very differently. On this street two years ago, police showed how a different approach to armed suspects can cut the risk of a fatal shootout. When Brian Goldsmith fired his gun, it wasn't just a couple of blanks. He had 200 live rounds. He'd already shot and wounded a local resident he held a grudge against. The police had to deal with him immediately as a lethal danger. My first thought was, oh shit, I'm scared. So what do I do from here? And it's automatic. Uh, I couldn't say how it comes in. It's, I knew I had to do something. While Lieutenant Conley crouched behind the front of his car, calling across to Brian Goldsmith, the police brought out their emergency response team. Step one, deprive the gunman of targets. It was utter chaos, uh, officers hunched down, shots being fired, neighbors running around, other police cars responding. So what was your first job? Well, to establish a perimeter, make what? sure that uh, we could secure the area, make sure that everyone that was in there, the neighbors and the innocent bystanders, were back into their houses or away from their houses and brought them back here behind the outer perimeter. All the way back, all the way back. The police procedure gains them time by removing points of danger. In step two, the firearms team arrive to begin taking up their positions under cover. Step three, a negotiator keeps in contact with the gunman and reports back. I was hearing from him that uh, what the subject was doing, uh, he was raising his gun, conversations were taking place. Uh, Lieutenant Burke and Terry Conley were behind their vehicle attempting to talk to the guy. It wasn't a textbook operation. The most serious gap in cover came as paramedics were moved up to take away the wounded neighbor. The negotiator had persuaded the gunman not to harm them, but if he'd tried, the police would have had to shoot him. My primary concern was saving the victim that was shot. That was my primary concern. That, and once that was dealt with, then you shift into the, uh, there was a second life to save there that day, and that was Brian Goldsmith. 
He's given in, man. Three hours later, Brian Goldsmith was talked into surrender. It cost police time and a lot of inconvenience to local residents. But once police arrived, nobody else was hurt. More than luck, the police kept the public and themselves out of danger. The approach police used to arrest Brian Goldsmith is not foolproof, but hundreds of American police departments now use it to prevent even the most dangerous suspects from forcing them into a shootout. Well, we use the term of the last picture frame. In the last picture frame, a police officer may have been confronted with a person with a gun. And the person may raise the gun towards the officer, and the officer fires. If we just look at that last picture frame, we would say, given the threat to the officer's life, that that shooting was justified. But if we rewind the tape, and we go back through the previous picture frames, we find out that the police made mistakes. Five years ago, firearms operations in Gloucester County were run solely by the SWAT team. You don't want anything to happen to her, do you, Frank? I wouldn't have shot her if I wanted her. But you know they have the now they train the alongside a team of negotiators under one independent command. They keep training to improve the system. They've now closed the earlier loophole and have learned to move paramedics under cover. Negotiators are in at the start of each operation with equal status to the tactical firearms team. In fact, we changed the whole concept. We felt that the SWAT team or the tactical group was not the only option in handling a situation like that. Not only do you need them, but you also needed some other type of intervention. And thus we developed the idea of a negotiations group. And then to bring them both together, we developed the idea of an operations officer, someone to coordinate and control both. Who is different from the SWAT team commander. That's correct. If I see any cops, they're dead. The firearms team trains to stay under cover. They're ready to shoot the suspect but avoid direct confrontation. The first step is to train your people, the officers responding, the first responders and the first supervisor on the scene as to what to do in the first 20 minutes because we can guarantee that that person is going to have a, um, a great say as to whether that critical incident is handled smoothly and appropriately or something goes wrong. It's the magic words, four magic words, give me a perimeter. He's ready to come out. Everybody set? Now, Fran, what I want you to do is I want you to walk over to the steps and just yell over to me that you're coming out. The subject is uh, agreed to come out. He's leaving his weapon inside. He'll be taking... The first time police emerge from cover is when the suspect has agreed to surrender. Okay, we received uh, notice he is coming out. Uh, send in your arrest team. Nothing they do should escalate danger. Come on out, come on out. Step out the door, sir. The police insurers have encouraged this approach, anxious to avoid paying millions in compensation to bereaved relatives. In four years, this police team has dealt with more than 60 armed suspects without firing a single shot. The only casualty was a gunman who shot himself. All units on the scene be advised, subject is in custody. Police have a very different approach in West Yorkshire. Look, and it shoots! Left! This is one of only six national firearms training centres in Britain. Officers from all over the country come to study tactics for armed sieges. West Yorkshire's approach appears to place less emphasis than the Americans on depriving a gunman of potential targets. In terms of commanding or managing a firearms operation, how important to the incident commander ought it to be that innocent members of the public are cleared from the scene? Well, it's got to be a priority, but the, the main priority is to stop the person with the gun causing any damage. We, we mustn't forget that. That is the overriding aim of the operation. If we are successful in stopping the person with the gun causing a threat, 
It matters not how many actual members of the public are in the vicinity. It's an approach which can end in tragedy, as it did in West Yorkshire on New Year's Day 1992. In Rastrick, a man smashed a taxi windscreen in an argument and took to his window, waving a replica rifle around. Ian Bennett was drunk, and one of the neighbours called his parents. We were just getting ready to watch Coronation Street, and we got this telephone call, and it was from a, a relation. And he said, uh, Eric, do you know something about your Ian? I said, why, what's the matter? He says, it seems to be, it seems to be having a bit of trouble. He says, there's some police up there and whatnot. He said, did you know about it? I said, no. Oh, he said, I better tell you. So I said, OK. I said, we're going up. But Mr and Mrs Bennett were prevented from reaching their son's flat, held back 200 yards away. We were stopped when we came up here. Who stopped you? Policeman. And uh, he, asked, he said, we're going to have to turn back. So then my husband said... I think it's our son what's in trouble here. I said, I don't know what's going off. He said, who are you? I said, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. He said, hang on. And he radioed through to somewhere, and uh, he got the message back that we had to stay put. We might be needed. But inside the perimeter, people were still moving freely about the streets. A neighbour walked across with his video camera and provides a unique recording of what happened. At that time, as I, I was stood across the road from where he lived between some houses, um, stood just on the corner of a wall with a few friends, actually watching to see what was actually going on. How clear a view could you get of what was happening at the flat? Well, perfect, really. Um, you can see the view that's there, and my eye seen it better than the camera did. How far were you from the flat? Oh, 150 feet, if that. When police arrived, there was a small group of amused onlookers watching Ian Bennett with his replica rifle. For more than an hour, his audience was allowed to grow. Some of them were shouting at him because they just thought, uh, he's a drunk, letting off a bit of steam. So one of them shouted out about, you better pay your poll tax next time. But apart from that, it was just sort of being a bit lippy. There were babies out with the parents. They were crying because of the cold. Um, there was children in the window opposite, in the bedroom window. So there was a man with what looked like a gun pointing out of a window, and there were people here with their babies? Yeah. Even those living immediately opposite Ian Bennett's window were allowed to wander around within his range. There just seemed to be quite a lot of people stood about um, too close. Two or three people actually came out of the crowd who I know to come across and talk to me. And they were just like wandering backwards and forwards from the crowd. Did you see any attempt by the police to clear the crowd off this street? No. No, there was no attempt to clear them. The local inspector arrived half an hour into the incident and saw 150 to 200 people on the street. Ian Bennett was still waving his rifle from the window. The inspector could only assume it was real as he said later. There was an obvious danger. I realised we had a potentially horrendous situation on our hands. But the inspector said that when he radioed for urgent help to get the crowd back, he was told he'd have to wait. The message came over the radio, a terse, very short message, and the implication was that we don't want bothering now. We've got a lot of things going on. Please just do what you can. Did the police try to force you back? No, not on any occasion, no. So what did they say to you? They just asked us, um, will you move back? There's a man down there with a gun, you know, but uh, we didn't take a great deal of notice. How many police officers did you see trying to move the crowd back? One. One? Mm. This was the view Ian Bennett had from his window. For more than an hour, the handling of the incident left him scores of potential targets, neighbours and police. So what began as a public nuisance was permitted to escalate into a lethal danger. Ian Bennett had only to appear to aim at any of these targets to sign his death warrant. And he did. This is where the actual van came down the street. 
There's a three armed police here. Behind the van? Yeah, at the back. They just see them coming into shot now. Having failed to clear the streets, police had few options and no time. The firearms commander did what the Americans trained to avoid, sending his team forward to distract Ian Bennett from the crowd. But the police had no bulletproof cover, and when Ian Bennett took aim at them, within seconds, the one-sided shootout was over. I heard the three shots, and I says to him, I says, oh my God, this is have shot my son, my lad, I said. He said, no, they haven't. He says, they'll be blanks. That's right, must be. I said, said they're just trying to frighten him, maybe frighten him out, something like that. In fact, Ian Bennett had been hit by three police bullets. It was the local inspector who told his father he was dead. He says he's being shot. He said they've shot him. He said, I'm very sorry. I said, I just sat there. I, I, I just couldn't get over it. And all he did, he had his hand around my shoulder. And he just said, I'm very sorry. And I, 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 he said, now, he says, Miss Strong, he says, what about telling your wife? I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I says, I'm not going to do it. I said, God knows, I said, I'm going to do it. I said, you tell me. I said, you tell me. It was deemed a lawful killing because in the final frame, Ian Bennett appeared a mortal threat. But look at the frames leading up to it. There was no negotiator at the scene. Armed police were sent forward out of cover to distract Ian Bennett from a crowd which had not been cleared from danger. If we'd had a lot of officers, enough officers, we could have done it by consent by talking to people, by asking them. We didn't have a lot of officers. Isn't the danger of this, though, that you're saying we have equipped ourselves as a police force to send armed officers forward to very dangerous situations? We haven't equipped ourselves to get the public out of the way. No, that's not true. We have armed our officers reluctantly and brought them up to a level at which they can deal with armed suspects. We have, with all of our training and in our tactics, the first priority is the unarmed containment as well as the armed containment. But you the say unarmed that's the containment, first priority, but it's not the what unarmed you containment did. is to actually getting the perimeter, making the sterile area, moving people back to a safe distance. But that's in not the, what you actually did. That's what you say said, you should have done. Well, I said, the difference between theory and practice is great, as we all know. The theory is set out in secret police guidelines, which Panorama has seen. The guiding principle for firearms operations says it is the duty of the police to safeguard the public, and this must be their first priority. Officers should keep the public away from the location of the armed suspect, which didn't happen at Rastrick. So how does the principle of safeguarding the public square with what West Yorkshire Police did? The protection of members of the public was in the police officers training firearms on that man so that they came to a situation where they believed that he was going to fire on those members of the public or on themselves because they put themselves in between. Then they stopped and protected the public by shooting at that man and that's what they did. But does that not mean that the way your officers conducted that operation heightened the likelihood that it would be resolved with a fatal shootout and reduced the options for ending it peacefully by getting the crowd out of the way. Uh, with respect, the person who heightened uh, the, the consequences of that uh, was Mr. Bennett. Well, they should have learned to be, have a bit more patience and to hide themselves. And now they get a family, one of family to speak to them, and if that doesn't help, then to just stop where they are and hide themselves and keep everybody away from that and leave them alone. They'll come out eventually. And that's what they should have done with our ear. 
Last year, another tragedy seemed imminent when this man, David Taylor, threatened police with a replica rifle. He'd been drinking too and was equally abusive. Worse still, unlike Ian Bennett, he wanted to die by forcing police to shoot him. Remarkably, David Taylor lived to tell the story himself. Basically, I guess the first thing I told him was anybody that tries to enter my home, they're going to see the end of a barrel. And I'm going to blow away the first cop I see. So he better be fast. Shoot me first before I shoot them. Did you think the police would actually shoot you if you pointed a gun at them? I knew they would. I wanted them to. I knew if I did the unspeakable and pointed a weapon at a police officer, he's got no choice. It's, it's kill or be killed. It's the way you're trained in the military. It's the way a police officer is trained. It was to prove an extreme test of the police system in New Jersey. As David Taylor threatened to use the rifle only he knew was a replica, the police team set up a secure perimeter and took cover. The streets, the main road uh, coming up to my street was blocked in a half a mile of both directions. So as you looked from your windows, could you see any of your neighbors or members of the public? No, no. Well, once we had gotten the original officers, or the initial responding officers, back away from the house, we didn't give David a target. And then essentially, David was inside the house by himself and couldn't see any other officers within the immediate area. Where were they? They were hidden on different parts of the house or the property and places that David couldn't see them. So the police had bought time for their negotiator to talk David Taylor into surrender. They basically said, you got a lot to live for. Your home, your family, your job. There's so much you have and you're willing to waste it. We don't want to be the cause of you wasting it. We're not going to do what you want. After a standoff of more than three hours, David Taylor was talked out and taken away in police custody. He was convicted of making terroristic threats. Again, the American police operation succeeded by denying him the chance to harm anyone except himself. The analogy is a house in the desert, so that that person could take any action and is so completely contained that the place is so sterile that any action that they took would not injure anybody and then let time work for you. It took more than three hours to arrest Brian Goldsmith, while police in New Jersey worked constantly to keep the area clear. Arresting David Taylor also took three hours, while his neighbors were unable to go to or from their homes. Ian Bennett was killed within 15 minutes of the police firearms team arriving, watched by more than 150 people on the streets. Three years later, what had West Yorkshire police learned to prepare them to face Robert Dixon last Christmas. There was no negotiator at the scene, and again, police failed to keep the public and themselves out of danger. They even allowed a local man to walk with his friend past a uniformed officer and up to the front door of Robert Dixon's bungalow, right in the line of fire. First thing I saw when we started coming up the ginnel was a black Mariah part there and a police officer come out and me and Simon said, all right, to the police officer. And he said, all right, and we walked up the ginnel here. And we were walking on here talking, wondering why black Mariah were there. <coughs> and we got in front of Bob's house. Just here? Yeah, just here. And a, a big light shone upon us. Now, we didn't know where it light what sort of light it were at all. Where was it coming from? It was coming from the corner. Just over there? the car park there, yeah. Where that car is? Yeah. And we heard, well, I heard a voice saying, keep walking forward, don't turn back, just keep walking forward right fast. So what did you do? So we just, me and Simon just walked real, as fast as we could all the way along here. What did you think? Well, we didn't think no of it because we couldn't see no, because at light it was too bright. It was shining in his eyes. But you but walked right past the front right, door, stopped yeah. outside it. The two men walked on, but later watched standing behind the police car. 
And there was a gallery of neighbours watching too, from their bedroom windows. I was looking from the window across at what was going on. They must have seen me because, I mean, the car is only just there. But they didn't say nothing because there was also a lads next door shouting across. And they didn't say to get in or whatever. Did a police officer knock at your door and tell you what you should be doing? No, he didn't. No, nobody knocked at the door. From across the car park, Denise Woods watched the police operation from her bedroom. There was the police car facing Bob's. The, both doors were, were open. From where you were, what protection could you see that had been arranged either for the police officers or for the public who were there? None, apart from the car door that the policeman was stood behind. The officers Denise Woods could see were crouched behind ordinary car doors, giving them minimal cover. But after the shooting of Ian Bennett three years earlier, the West Yorkshire force had bought two armoured Land Rovers. Why were your officers not under bulletproof cover? What do you mean by bulletproof cover? Why were they in a vehicle which would offer limited, if any, cover and sheltering behind the driver and the passenger doors, which are not bulletproof? The vehicle itself offers a small amount of protection. The officers themselves had um, protective gear on, as is standard. This is standard practice. There would have been, and I'm I've spoken to the, the officer, the consideration of bringing the ballistically protected vehicles forward, but they're slow and cumbersome. They, they were being in the process of, uh, of looking at to getting them out and bringing them forward. You'd had three and a half hours from a, the first report of Robert Dixon shooting his gun in the street. Yes, that, those officers were taking the position where they were in a position of some cover, admittedly not a great amount of cover, but there was no major cover there. The theory and practice is, again, a large, different area. Robert come back to the door with a, a revolver in his hand, and they were pointing him straight at the police car, which was parked there. And the policeman says, will you please put the gun down and walk this way? And Robert told them all to fuck off and that lot, and fired twice. In the final moment, armed police saw Robert Dixon pointing his gun, an apparent threat to all the targets their operation had left him. The officers facing him later told the inquest. I concentrated on the fact that my partner stood behind me, virtually exposed numerous people in gardens and at bedroom windows, so there was no time to react, just a fraction of a second. I was in immediate fear of my life, my colleagues and the people who were behind, and that's when I returned fire. I said, oh my God, no, Bob. I said, I think you've been shot. And they saw me, and they said, come, come out, we won't hurt you, dear, we're the police. Did you know they were the police? No, I didn't, not until then. I had no idea who they were. And what did you do? Well, I went, I went up to Bob and tried to go, but he was, I think he was already dead. I honestly do. So I went back in, and I could only get my stick. I couldn't get the wheelchair, because it was, it was laid across the doorway. And they told me to come there as I was. Well, I only had my nightie on and my slippers, and I had to go out like that. I saw Bob fall down, and then next minute we knew, me and Simon, there were policemen coming down, and they're scotting us off the green. So they moved you away? Once he'd been shot. Once it all been over. Did anyone try to move you away before? No. 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 Did your officers adequately attempt to keep the public out of danger at that scene? I think you've got two, two, two questions. Did they adequately attempt? Uh, they certainly attempted. Uh, the results of that, uh, their attempts, were not 100% successful. If you've got 
as one of the witnesses told not only us but the inquest on oath if you've got a a member of the public walking past a police officer they exchange pleasantries and that member of the public then walks right in front of Robert Dixon's house between the front door and the police car did that officer act properly that was regrettable that shouldn't have occurred but it did just as Robert Dixon's neighbors were allowed to remain in the line of fire at their bedroom windows the actual priority of West Yorkshire police was once again to train their guns on the suspect in the hope that he would surrender. They did not keep themselves or the public away from danger. It's an approach which doesn't often fail. But when it does, another suspect may pay the price with his life. 